today, June 18, 2021, I'm going to read to you a chapter from Clarissa Pinkolo Estes' book, Women Who Run With Wolves. This is about the ugly duckling. Originally, it's the fairy tale of Hans Andersen. And I will read a little bit about that and then continue with Clarissa's views and experiences on that. A human experience feeling like an ugly duckling. Here it begins. It was near the time of harvest. The old women were making green dolls from corn sheaves. The old men were mending the blankets. The girls were embroidering their white dresses with blood-red flowers. The boys were singing as they pitched golden hay. The women were knitting scratchy shirts for the coming winter. The men were helping to pick and pull and cut and hoe the fruits the fields had brought forth. forth. The wind was just beginning to loosen the leaves a little more and then a little more each day. And down by the river there was a mother duck brooding on her nest of eggs. Everything was going as it should for his, this mother duck. And finally, one by one, her eggs began to tremble and shake until the shells cracked and out staggered all her new ducklings. But there was one egg left, a very big egg. It just sat there like a stone. An old duck came by and the duck mother showed off her new children. Aren't they good looking, she bragged, but the unhatched egg caught the old duck's attention and she tried to dissuade the duck mother from sitting on that egg any longer. It's a turkey egg, exclaimed the old duck, not a proper kind of egg at all. Can't get a turkey into the water, you know. She knew, for she had tried. But the duck mother felt that she had been sitting for such a long time, a little longer would not hurt. I'm not worried about that, she said. But do you know that scoundrel father of these ducklings hasn't come to visit me once? But eventually the big egg began to shudder and roll. It finally broke open and out tumbled a big ungainly creature. His skin was edged with curly red and blue veins. His feet were pale purple his eyes transparent pink. The duck mother cocked her head and stretched her neck and peered at him. She couldn't help herself. She pronounced him ugly. Maybe it's a turkey after all, she worried. But when the ugly duckling took to the water with the other, with the other offspring, the duck mother saw that it swam right straight and true. Yes, he's one of my own, even though he's very peculiar in appearance. But actually, in the right light, he is almost handsome. So she presented him to other creatures in the farmyard. But before she knew it, another duck shot across the courtyard and bit the ugly duckling right in the neck. The duck mother cried, Stop! But the bully sputtered, Well, he looks so strange and ugly, he needs to be pushed around. And the queen duck, with a red rag on her leg, said, Oh, we're not a brood, as though we don't have enough mouth to feed. And that one over there, that big ugly one, well, surely he was a mistake. He is not a mistake, said the duck mother. He's going to be very strong. He just laid in the egg too long and is yet a little misshapen. He will straighten out, though. You'll see. She groomed that ugly duckling's feathers and licked his cowlicks. And here's what Clarissa Pinkolo Estes is describing about how human beings live like a, an ugly duckling with the experience in the past, maybe. There are many artists who haven't yet gotten a good foothold or who are old war horses at developing their creative lives. And yet... And still, every time they reach for the pen, 
the brush, the ribbons, the script. They hear, you're nothing but trouble. Your work is marginal or completely unacceptable because you yourself are marginal and unacceptable. So wh what is the solution? Do as the duckling do do does. Go ahead, struggle through it. Pick up the pen already and put it to the page and stop whining. Write, pick up the brush and be mean to yourself for a change. Paint. Dancers, put on the loose chemise. Tie the ribbons in your hair, at your waist, at your ankles and tell the body to take it from there. Dance. Actress, playwright, poet, musician or any other. Generally, just stop talking. Don't say one more word unless you're a singer. Shut yourself in a room with a ceiling or in a clearing under the sky. Do your art. Generally, a thing cannot freeze if it is moving. So move. Keep moving. Although in the story the farmer taking the duck home seems to be a literary device to further the story rather than an archetypal leitmotif about exile, there is a thought here that I think is valuable. The person who might take us out of the ice, who might even psychically free us from our lack of feeling, is not necessarily going to be the one to whom we belong. It may be, as in the story, another of those magical but fleeting events that again came along when we least expected it. An act of kindness from a passing stranger. This is another example of nourishment of the psyche that occurs when one is at the end of one's rope and cannot stand it anymore. Then a something that is sustaining appears out of nowhere to assist you and then disappears into the night, leaving you wondering. Was that a person or a spirit? It might be a sudden gust of luck that brings something very needed in through your door. It might be as simple as thing, a thing as a respite, a let up in pressure, a small space of rest and repose. This is not a fairy tale we are talking about now, but real life. Whatever it might be, it is a time when the spirit, in one way or another, feeds us, pulls us out, shows us the secret passage, the hiding place, the escape route. <clears throat> and this coming, when we are down and feeling stormy dark or darkly calm, is what pushes us through the channel to the next step the next phase in learning the strength of the exile. If you have attempted to fit whatever mold and failed to do so, you are probably lucky. You may be an exile of some sort, but you have sheltered your soul. There is an odd phenomenon that occurs when one keeps trying to fit and fails. Even though the outcast is driven away, she is at the same time driven right into the arms of her psychic and true kin, whether these be a course of study, an art form, or a group of people. It is worse to stay where one does not belong at all than to wander about lost for a while and looking for the psychic and soulful kinship one requires. It is never a mistake to search for what one requires. Never. There is something useful in all this torque and tension. Something in the duckling is being tempered, being made strong by this exile. While this situation is not one we would wish on anyone for any reason, its effect is similar to pure natural carbon under pressure, producing diamonds. It leads eventually to a profound magnitude and clarity of psyche. There is an aspect of alchemy wherein the base substance of lead is pounded ab about and beaten down. While exile is not a thing to desire for the fun of it, there is an unexpected gain from it. The gift of exile are many. It takes out weakness by the pounding. It removes whininess, enables acute insight, heightens intuition, grants the power of keen observation and perspective that the insider can never achieve. 
Even though there are negative aspects to it, the wild psyche can endure exile. It makes us yearn that much more to free our own nature, our own true nature, and causes us to long for a culture to match. Even this yearning, this longing makes a person to go on. It makes a woman go on looking, and if she cannot find the culture that encourages her, then she usually decides to construct it herself. And that is good, for if she builds it, others who have been looking for a long time will mysteriously arrive one day, enthusiastically proclaiming that they have been looking for this all along. The uncombed cat and the cross-eyed hen find the duckling's aspirations stupid and nonsensical. It gives just the right perspective on the touchiness and the values of others who denigrate those who are not like themselves. Who would expect a cat to like the water? Who would expect a hen to go swimming? No one, of course, but too often from the exile's point of view, when people are not alike, it is the exile who is inferior and the limitations and or motives of the other are not properly weighed or evaluated. Well, in the spirit of not wanting to make one person less and another person more, or any more than we have to for the purposes of discussion, let us just say that here the duckling has the same experience that thousands of exiled women have. That of a basic incompatibility incompatibility with dissimilar persons, which is no one's fault, even though most women are too obliging and take it on as though it is their fault personally. When this happens, we see women who are ready to apologize for taking up space. We see women who are already, we are, who are afraid to just say, no thank you, and leave. We see women who listen to someone telling them they are wrong-headed, over and over again, without understanding that cats don't swim and hens don't dive underwater. I must admit, I sometimes find it useful in my practice to delineate the various typologies of personality as cats and hens, and ducks and swans, and so forth. If warranted, I might ask my client to assume for a moment that she is a swan who doesn't realize it. Assume also for a moment that she has been brought up by or is currently surrounded by ducks. There's nothing wrong with ducks, I assure them, or with swans, but ducks and swans, ducks are ducks and swans are swans. Sometimes to make the point I have to move to other animal metaphors. What if you were raised by the mice people? But what if you're, say, a swan? Swans and mice hate each other's food for the most part. They eat each think the other smells funny. They are not interested in spending time together, and if they did, one would be constantly harassing the other. But what if you, being a swan, had to pretend you were a mouse? What if you had to pretend to be grey and furry and tiny? What if you had no long snaky tail to carry in the air on tail-carrying day? <laughs> what, if, what if wherever you went you tried to walk like a mouse? but you waddled instead. What if you tried to talk like a mouse, but instead out came a honk every time? Wouldn't you be the most miserable creature in the world? The answer is an unequivocal yes. So why, if this is all so and too true, do women keep trying to bend and fold themselves into shapes that are not theirs? I must say, from the years of clinical observation of this problem, that most of the time it is not because of deep-seated masochism or a malignant dedication to self-destruction or anything of that nature. More often it is because the woman simply does not know any better. She is unmothered. There is a saying, to Puedes saber muchas cosas. You can know about things, but it is not the same as sentido, possessing sense. 
using common sense. The duckling seems to know things, but he has no sense. He is, he is unmothered, meaning untaught at the most basic level. Remember, it is the mother who teaches by expanding the innate talents of the offspring. Animal mothers who teach their offspring to hunt are not exactly teaching them how to hunt, for that is in their bones already. But they are teaching them what to watch out for, what to pay attention to. Those things are not known to them until the mother shows them, thereby activating new learning and innate wisdom. It is the same for the women, the woman in exile. If she is an ugly duckling, if she is unmothered, her instincts have not been sharpened. She learns instead by trial and error, usually many trials, many, many errors. But there is hope, for you see, the exile never gives up. She keeps going till she finds the guide, the scent, till she finds the trail, till she finds home. Wolves never look more funny than when they have lost the scent and scrabble to find it again. They hop in the air, they run in circles, they blow up the ground with their noses. They scratch the ground, then run ahead, then back, then stand stock still. They look as if they have lost their wits, but what they are really doing is picking up all the clues they can find. They are biting them down out of the air. They're filling up their lungs, lungs with the smells of ground level and at shoulder level. They are tasting the air to see who has passed through it recently. Their ears are rotating like satellite dish dishes, <laughs> picking up transmissions from afar. Once they have all these clues in one place, they know what to do next. Though a woman may look scattered when she has lost touch with the life she values most and is running about trying to recapture it, she is most often gathering information, taking a taste of this, grabbing up a paw of that. At the very most, one might briefly, briefly explain to her what it is that she is doing, then let her be. As soon as, the, as she processes all the information from the clues she has gathered, she'll be moving in an intentional manner again. Then the desire for membership in the uncombed cats and cross-eyed hen club will diminish to nothing. We all have a longing that we feel for our own kind, our wild kind. The duckling, you will recall, ran away after being tortured without mercy. Next, he had a run-in with a gaggle of geese and was almost killed by hunters. He was chased from the barnyard and from a farmer's home. And finally, exhausted, he shivered at the edge of the lake. There's no woman among us who doesn't know his feeling. And yet, it is just this longing that leads us to hang on, to go on, to proceed with hope. Here is the promise from the wild psyche to all of us. Even though we have only heard about, glimpsed or dreamt the wondrous wild world that we belong to once, even though we have not yet or only momentarily touched it, even though we do not identify ourselves as part of it, the memory of it is a beacon that guides us toward what we belong to. And for the rest of our lives, in the ugly duckling, a knowing yearning stirs when he sees the swans lift up into the sky. And from that single event, his remembrance of that vision sustains him. Today, June 18th.